Hi everybody, I'm Mike Vance with uh, the Brenham Heritage Museum. I'm the content director, and we are very fortunate to have with us on our first guest show here, uh, a good friend of mine, Steve Harden, who is a, a professor at McMurray University up in Abilene, and has written numerous articles and books. Uh, the most famous, I would imagine, is Texie and Iliad, correct? Well, that's the one that sold the most, certainly. And that is uh, still the definitive military history of the Texas Revolution. And yeah, it's kind of, it, it amazes me how long that book has been around. That book was uh, published in 1994 by the University of Texas Press, and it has never gone out of print, uh, for which I am grateful. And, uh, you know, I, I still get a royalty check every uh, October, and uh, some of my friends use it in their classes, and again, I'm grateful for that. I still use the it. Book, um, the book has legs. Yeah. But, uh, I, but I desperately need to do a second edition of it. Every time I pick it up, I say to myself, uh, uh, I, I could do better. I, I know more now. Uh, well, we're going to talk some Texas Revolution. Go uh, ahead. But just not the military side of it. Oh, that, yes. In fact, my next book, uh, also about the Texas Revolution, will have nothing or very little to do with the, the military. My next book will be a, a soup to nuts history of the 1836 runaway scrape, which was the mass exodus of Texas civilians who were trying to get out of Texas into uh, most of them Louisiana uh, or Arkansas. Uh, or even Indian territory in some cases, in an effort to uh, get away from uh, Santana's uh, armies. When can we expect that book, by the way? Uh, boy, I'm a slow writer. I hope to finish that before I die. <laughs> so don't run down to the bookstore and wait at this point. No, no, this one, I haven't even talked to a publisher about this one. Very well, much still in being Washington County, um, let's talk about, when we say the Texas Revolution, let's talk about the word revolution for a second. You sent a paper that you had written that uh, has some really interesting history that I think most people probably don't realize. Yeah. Well, there are so many uh, fall fallacies and, and misunderstandings regarding what we call the Texas Revolution. And if you look at that word, I mean, the dictionary definition of a, well, I mean, in political terms now, we're talking about revolution, not right. revolution of your, um, you know, vinyl record. You remember vinyl records. I remember vinyl records. I imagine there are some people in this audience that have no idea what I'm talking about. Although, uh, I was reading the other day that they sell more in vinyl than on CD. So uh, vinyl's making a comeback, so I, you know, which delights me. Uh, but uh, although I, I, I no longer have a turntable, my, my daughter does. Uh, but uh, it's interesting how how the kids are, are bringing vital back. I, that's great. But at any rate, Go. but when we're talking about a political revolution, it is a complete restructuring, a reweaving, if you will, of the political fabric. Um, and a lot of people describe the American Revolution uh, as a conservative revolution, a conservative revolution. And I always thought that that was oxymoronic, or maybe just moronic, <laughs> uh, because conservatives, and I know something about this because I am one, uh, we resist change. We don't like change. And uh, a revolution is 
a total and systemic change. So to say it's a conservative revolution just doesn't make sense. Uh, and that's why I, in my classes, try to avoid the term uh, American Revolution. It, it, it may have been a rebellion. It may have been a revolt. But I don't really think it was a revolution. I mean, a revol according to Hoyle, revolution. Now, the French Revolution, yeah. The, the Russian Revolution of 1917, those were honest to God revolutions. Uh, but the American Revolution was not, and neither was the Texas Revolution. We talk about in the Texas Revolution era, yeah. that you have to understand it's part of a civil war in Mexico. It, it was indeed, and, and, and thank you. Uh, most of the Anglo immigrants who started coming into Texas uh, after 1821, and between 1821 and 1835, had come in uh, under the Constitution of the Federalist Constitution of 1824. And under that Constitution, most of the, the power of government, and I'm talking about the Mexican government here, right. most of the power of government was concentrated at the state and local level. Uh, only, and, and almost from the beginning, there were two factions within the Mexican government. And people need to remember in this country that Mexico had only been a country since 1821. And it's kind of interesting that Mexico declares its independence and Anglo immigration began the same year. So 1821 is a, is a real important year in, in, in Texas history. And Mexico's kind of feeling their their way here. They're, and they, they they're are Mexico, they Mexico and Mexicans are struggling to find their footing. What kind of a country do we want to be? What kind of a country uh, should we be? And uh, of everybody, uh, knows they, they don't want a monarchy because that's what they had under Spain. That's what they fought uh, for 10 years to get rid of. 10% of the uh, Mexican population died in that struggle for independence. So they knew they didn't want to be any part of Spain. And I think most people uh, found the idea of a Republican form of government. Now, let me hasten to add, I'm talking about little r Republican. Right. Mike, don't, don't freak out, you know, you, you old yellow dog Democrat, you. Uh, Republican form of government, I and mean, they look to the United States as most of the, the fledgling countries in Latin America did. Right. Uh, because of all the Western hemisphere nations, the United States of America, America was the first one to throw off the shackles of colonialism. So uh, the United States was poised to serve in a big brother role. Okay, And, and uh, so it, I've, I've heard it said, and, and I've read it, that the Constitution of, of 1824 was modeled extensively uh, after the Philadelphia Charter of, of, of 1787. That's true, but not to the extent that it's been said. Uh, there were certain similarities, but there were also significant differences. For example, uh, in Mexico, under the Constitution of 1824, people did not have religious freedom. Everybody had to be a Roman Catholic. So that's a significant difference. And uh, the, well, the, let, uh, me, let me interrupt yeah. here. The, the Texans, the Americans, I should say, that come into Texas dealt with that. Um, early on, they were more accepting. They were glad to get their gift of land. And then you yeah. got a, a few that were a little more 
complainers that came in uh, later that that were not so uh, in a hurry? Well, most, uh, mostly uh, mostly Methodist, mostly Methodist. Uh, they were at that time called the shouting Methodist because their uh, sermons were, you know, fire and brimstone and uh, very emotional and whatnot. And these guys were a real challenge uh, for the impresario Stephen F. Austin, who had to uh, speak sternly to them. And, uh, but, but I think most of the Anglo colonists understood that you could believe anything you wanted to in your heart as long as you didn't make a big show of it. And the fact of the matter is uh, there were so few uh, Mexican government officials in Texas anyway. It's an unenforceable requirement. Uh, so uh, these uh, differences in the Constitution of 1824 were not deal killers for most of the American colonists. Uh, primarily because they were getting more land than they could shake a stick at. So what uh, did they, most what guys did they want? They got a, a league and a labor, and that translates to 4,428 acres. And uh, I mean, my God, uh, Andrew Jackson's hermitage was only about 100 acres. So, I, I mean, you had people who came to Texas uh, penniless, and suddenly they, they have land like the gentry have back in Georgia, back in Alabama. Uh, they still well, don't have any money. People, these people they're, had, they're, they're land rich, but, but cash poor. These people uh, had it really, really good. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, they knew. Listen, they knew what a good deal they had. And most of them said, uh, for God's sakes, this is a good deal. Don't mess it up. Don't so mess what, this up. So they didn't. The point here is they did not want to leave Mexico. So they, what they're asking for is to become recognized as a state just to get a little more freedom within Mexico. So they weren't out to to join, you know, to, to leave Mexico at all. And the irony is here, when, when Santana runs as a Federalist, as a liberal in 1833 and gets elected, he, he has to be a liberal to get into power. But once he gets into power, to stay in power, he has to become a centralist. And that involves him making a Faustian bargain with the Roman Catholic Church and the Mexican military, which he does. But once he has the church and the military on his side, he says, with some justification, look, guys, we have tried this Federalist system now for almost 11 years. Sounded good. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't work. So I'm doing away with the Constitution of 1824, and I'm going to establish a centralist government where most of the power of government resides here in Mexico City. And uh, of course, north uh, of the uh, Rio Grande, we are taught that uh, Santana was a, a dictator, a despot, a pirate. But the more I read about Mexican politics, the more sympathy I have for them. Uh, even, even Stephen F. Austin complained about the lack of progress. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he, he, he went down to Mexico for the first time in 1821. He went back in 1833. Now this is after, you know, the Constitution of 1824, and he writes in his diary, he said, you know, I really had hoped I'd see more progress down here, but I don't. So 
you know, that that's a, a discussion for another day. But most of not only the Anglo-American uh, colonists who, who now styled themselves as Texians, uh, the Texians are almost without exception a dedicated Federalist, as are most of the uh, native-born uh, Tejanos. Uh, are. So, so Texas is a Federalist uh, bastion. So yeah. let's, you mentioned Austin, and Austin famously um, gets put in, in prison, and that's another, mm -hmm. that's another day's discussion. Yes. But when he gets out of prison, Austin, there's still a lot of people that are not openly pushing for Texas to leave Mexico, but follow the money, and in order to achieve what they want to achieve, Tell, tell us about what Austin finds. He makes a trip back to uh, the United States. Well, when this conflict begins on October 2nd, 1835, nobody is using the I word. Now, by that, I mean independence. Uh, it isn't, a, now some people are thinking it, but very few. These are, are people in the war party. And uh, the war party are, uh, and there were never very many people in the war party. There were about uh, two dozen. So about 24 people, but they're 24 of the most motivated and articulate and passionate people in Texas. And eventually they, you know, public opinion comes around to their point of view. But, but they are uh, very similar to the uh, Sons of Liberty that, that agitate for independence during the American War for Independence. But at any rate, uh, in, in October, when the war begins, this is a war not to reweave the social fabric. Their impulses are conservative. They want to preserve the status quo. They want to uh, preserve the Constitution of 1824. They want to preserve federalism as they had always known it. The people who want to change things are Santana and the Centralist. So I, I don't think most people realize that. And uh, in, in November, of, uh, of uh, 1835, the uh, interim government of Texas issues a declaration of causes. In other words, look, this is why we're doing this. And uh, they give a, a many, many reasons uh, for, for fighting this war, but they never mentioned the word independence. And, and another thing they don't mention, that they don't, they don't mention slavery as as a, a cause right. of this war, uh, as has been alleged. But but at any rate, uh, it, it, so so again, let me reiterate, when the war begins in October, everybody says, no, 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 this is this is, we're, we're trying to preserve the Constitution of 1824. Uh, we are fighting this war as loyal Mexicans. This is a Mexican civil war, and we have taken the Federalist side in that war. Now, fast forward to January 1836. By go. this time, uh, Stephen F. Austin has been sent to the United States as an agent, and uh, he writes a letter in mid-January. I don't remember the exact date, but it's, it's in mid-January. And he writes back to Texas and he says, look, you guys need to declare outright independence. And he makes a case. Uh, now, Texians are fighting this war, but wars are expensive. And they are well aware that there's no way, uh, there are millions of Mexicans 
and there are about 30,000 Anglo Texans. And, and, and that includes women and children and old men and, sure. and people who are not of, of military age. So uh, we're tremendously outnumbered, and we need help. And we know that uh, we, we had hoped that we would get help from other Mexican Federalists. But the other Mexican Federalists don't trust us. And why should they? I, I and, and, and yeah, they, they shouldn't. They shouldn't actually, because we've, we've got these people already agitating. So, so the dream of this uh, wonderful alliance uh, between Texians and Federalist Mexicans, that, that, that just never comes to fruition. And right. uh, in, in let fact, me, in this, let, me in this letter, this, let me clarify, yeah. by the Federalist Mexicans, you're not talking about the Tejanos here. We're talking about the people no. that are in Coahuila, that are, you know, places like Saltillo and Monclova, these other politicians. The ones that had been in Zacatecas, but the Zacatecan Federalists have, have already been crushed by I some of his centralist army. So they're, they're out of the equation. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Federalist uh, Mexicans below the Nueces. And, and notice that I don't say the Rio Grande because the Rio Grande is not at that time the international or even a state boundary. Uh, crossing the uh, Rio Grande, or as the Mexicans called it, the, the Rio Bravo del Norte, uh, it did not have the sense of occasion it would later have because the Nueces uh, was considered the, the boundary between the Mexican states of Apalipas and Coahuila. Uh, now that is going to be a major bone of contention uh, which is going to lead to the Mexican War. Sure. But, but uh, during the treaties of Velasco, uh, the fledgling Republic of Texas, and I'm getting ahead of myself, right. uh, declare, declare the, the Rio Grande as the, the boundary. Now, the Mexican government uh, never... Uh, well, we had a, a little, I had to take care of the ringing phone issue but let me use that that moment to fast forward again Stephen Austin is in uh, New Orleans and when he writes back and says you guys need to declare independence he's talking about money yeah they they're looking for independence um, as a means to an end to get a loan yeah well, and, and there's a reason for that, and it's interesting because he is obviously in, in the South because uh, going to the North uh, to get support uh, for the Texas war uh, is a non-starter. There's no support or very little support in, in the North because they don't want another slave state in the union. So he directs most of his efforts at, in Southern banks, and he goes to a lot of Southern banks. He talks to a lot of Southern bankers. And they say, uh, Mr. Austin, very interesting proposition, but let me get this straight. Uh, you want us to lend you money to support this war. But even if you win, you're still going to be part of Mexico. Is that right? Well, yes, sir. This is a war to sustain the Federalist Constitution of 1824. And they tell him very forthrightly, well, we really have no interest in funding a, uh, a Mexican domestic squabble. Now, if you guys were interested in declaring outright independence, we, we, would, we would be interested in that. Which prompts the question, why? Well, what you have to, context is everything. 
And in 1836, in the Congress of the United States, there are an equal number of free states and slave states. And you've got this balance of power. And because you've got this balance of power, it's at loggerheads. Now, if Texas comes into the union, everybody knows what kind of a state it is going to come in as. It is going to come in as a slave state. And Texas is a big state. Uh, Texas is about the size, even the occupied parts of Texas are about the size of Georgia and Alabama uh, combined. And uh, there are, in 1836, about 5,000 slaves in Texas. And if Texas declares its independence or even becomes part of the Union, there are going to be a lot more. A lot of people are going to move to Texas and they're going to bring slaves with them. Everybody knows it. So if Texas can come into the Union, that could tilt the balance of, of, of power in the favor of the agricultural slave South in their struggles against the industrial free North. So that's why Southern bankers are on board with, uh, with Texas declaring independence. And uh, Austin writes back in mid-January, he says, guys, declare independence because this, you know, betting that on Mexican Federalists, no, that's a losing bet. But these guys in, in the United States are, uh, are on board and support the idea of, of independence and are willing to give us uh, money if, if we take that step. Now, the let, me bring this, let me bring this full circle. Okay. You started by talking about the American Revolution. Yeah. And so when everybody goes back and, and we were Washington County, so I promised we'd bring this back to Washington County locality. Oh, we're going to get to Washington pretty quick here. When everybody shows up at Washington, now we think of it as Washington on the brasses, but they just called it Washington. When they show up there, um, this is not like the Philadelphia conventions. So explain what was taking place there. Well, the, the irony is that Austin, who has always been during the time he is an impresario, he's Mr. Mexico. He's Mr. Go along and get along. He's Mr. Everybody obey Mexican laws. And now even Stephen F. Austin is saying the only viable alternative is independence. So I think uh, that makes a, a big difference. I mean, that, that breaks, that, that you pass a psychological barrier when Mr. Mexico says, we got to declare independence. But, but yeah, uh, the, the decision for, for, the, for the Second Continental Congress to, to actually do the deed was a very agonizing one. There was the Olive Branch petition. They, they tried all sorts of things um, before they would take that final fatal step. That wasn't the case uh, at Washington, quite rightly, we, you know, the, the place is called Washington on the Brazos now, but people didn't call it Washington on the Brazos until after the Civil War. In 1836, everybody called it the town of Washington, the town of Washington. So, uh, again, you go there now, it's Washington on the Brazos State Park. Uh, that's that's a little anachronistic, but uh, at any rate, uh, every single delegate, and they they called the uh, convention to to begin on March first. Every single delegate 
knew full well what they were going there to do. And that's, uh, that's indicated with the kaleidoscopic speed with which they got business done. They, they called the convention to order on March 1st. The 52 delegates there on, uh, on declared independence the next day on March 2nd. Now, a lot of discussion. Folks are remembering their seventh grade Texas history at this juncture, and they're saying, Steve, you said 52 delegates. Weren't there 59 delegates uh, there at the town of Washington? Yes, but a lot of them weren't there on the day. They, they, you know, even then, Texas was a big place, and it took them time. And as they arrived there in the town of Washington, they would add their name to, to the Declaration of Independence. But there, were, there were actually 52 uh, delegates there on, uh, on March 2nd. Uh, George Childress uh, of Tennessee it gets credit for actually uh, authoring the Texas Declaration of Independence. And some historians uh, have speculated that he actually wrote the document in Tennessee and, and brought it to Texas in his saddlebag. It was, it, it was already written. I think that's probably true. Uh, this was not a committee effort to write it. This no, was not, no, there was, was a, a committee. Yeah. There was a committee named. They worked over the night and said, yeah, George, this looks fine. You know, uh, It's not as elegant. It's not as elegantly written as uh, Jefferson's uh, glorious document, but it does, it does follow the, the same form. And uh, you, you, can, you can see they're using Jefferson's document as a, as a template. And basically, it is it is a litany of all the things that Montana and the Mexican government has have done wrong, and uh, why why we are seeking independence. But uh, and another thing, everybody there, oh, I, not everybody, probably uh, not the two Tejanos. Uh, there were two uh, Tejanos representing the interest of, uh, of Bejarinos, the citizens of, of Bayer, uh, Jose uh, Antonio Navarro was one, and Jose uh, Navarro uh, is the other one. Uh, and, and I know a lot of people are thinking, well, Steve, you're, there, there were three, you're, you're, you're thinking you're 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 forgetting about lorenzo de zavala no i'm not lorenzo de zavala was not a tejano uh he was an interior mexican he was a native of the state of yucatan uh, but he was not a a tejano uh, i mean a real important guy but I, but I think labels are important. But, I, but they probably weren't in favor of, of annexation. But, but everybody else was. But they knew that independence was a necessary first step before they could ask for admission to the union. And I'm sure every one of those guys there thought it would happen much, much sooner than it did. And the reasons that the United States did not immediately annex Texas is probably a story for another day. It but, is. And I'll, I'll lead us to the wrap up here. Okay. By getting back to the book that you said that you're uh, working on now yeah. about the runaway scrape, because the timing of this, while they're declaring independence in Washington. <laughs> um, they, they, yeah. There's they other stuff going on to the West. They could not have picked a worst time 
to declare independence because this is March 1st that they assemble, March 2nd that, that they uh, declare independence. While they are doing this, the cannonballs of Santana's artillery are hammering the walls of the Alamo. The Alamo falls on March 6th. And the delegates, well, have to bug out <laughs> and, and go wherever. Their business, they, they have wrapped up their business, but it would seem to, to most of the Texian runaways that the Declaration of Independence is, is, has now become uh, scratches on squandered paper. You know, all, all this bluster about the rights of man and, and this and the Republican virtues and, and uh, how Santana's a rat fink. Uh, so what, you know? Uh, it is only with the victory of, at, at San Jacinto on April 21st, and it is, truthfully, it's not even victory at San Jacinto on the 20, April 21st, because while that is an important victory, what makes it a decisive victory is the next day. is the capture of Santana the next day on April 22nd. That, that, that changes the, as, as the cliche goes, that changes the calculus. Uh, well, we, we've got to, obviously, there are tons of other aspects of all this that we can talk about, but thank you. You've brought uh, some new information to what was going on, what led up to that uh, convention at Washington, and how the convention went down. So, Well, and you know, it's, I, again, I think there a lot of people will be surprised. Uh, five foreign countries were were represented. I mean, people from five foreign countries were were, were delegates. So you you had a guy from Canada, you had a, a guy from England, you know. So uh, it wasn't just uh, Anglo Americans. Uh, many uh, there was one delegate, and and I always this guy always cracks me up. He had been in Texas for eight days, but for whatever reason, they, they elected him to represent them. So the, the requirements to be a delegate at, at the town of Washington were, were not very stringent. But, and that's not, you know, that's not putting these guys down. And, and, right. and, uh, uh, and, and, and like the guys who signed the the Declaration of Independence in 1776. The guys who signed the Declaration of Independence in, uh, in 1836, every one of them was fully aware that they were signing their death warrant if we didn't win this thing. And when they signed it, it looked, I mean, all of the odds were against them. So I, I express tremendous admiration for the men who signed this document. Now, I mean, we can, we can talk about their motives on, on another occasion, you know, that's legitimate. But these guys had some skin in the game. If they're captured, they're dead. And they knew that. So it, 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 it required a tremendous moral courage to sign this document. And I, I, I don't think that's something that's uh, said often enough. Steve, thanks for uh, talking with us. Mike, it's been my pleasure. I, 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 we've, we've raised so many issues. I, I, I hope we can pursue those at a later date. Oh, count on it. I'll <laughs> count on it without a doubt.